So what I'm going to do now is uh, a kind of rather sort of hopefully not too long with introduction, introduction to um, a piece of work that I'm working on with Steve Rushton. And in many words, what I'm going to say is kind of a set sort of opening remark follows on pretty neatly from Steve's presentation. So, uh, and we're slightly running short of time, so I may actually um, take some of Steve's um, descriptions of Venus interests and Venus writing and, and sort of slightly skim over it because I know that you've heard all this and I don't think it's very useful to hear it again given that we're starting short time. But I want to start by um, talking about a conversation I had with Arthur Zemeski when he was here at the opening of his exhibition about a month ago or so, six weeks ago. And we sort of had a conversation about um, Okay, different approaches, I guess, different methodologies to, to work. And um, he said to me very clearly that he thought that for the job the job of the artist was 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 um, orientated around the fact that there should be no scripts. This was the exact words he said, there should be no scripts. That you start with a situation or a plan or an action, and then you kind of observe what happens. And I think you can see that. In, in at least the them and repetition downstairs very, very clearly that that's obviously a kind of methodology. And I guess I want to start with di by disagreeing <coughs> with him um, and saying instead that actually scripts are things that permeate our lives at every moment and that we, 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 we inhabit them um, in so many different ways. And I'm thinking of scripts as well in the broadest sense and in the most literal sense uh, you know, words spoken and, uh, to actions that we undertake to environments that we that we inhabit. So I want you to try and think of the idea of scripts in a in a broad sense. And that idea that that scripts and um, can elicit <coughs> behaviour, or perhaps <coughs> our behaviour is tied to a set of scripts that determine how we will act, is obviously exactly what Steve has, has explored in his last presentation. And um, I, I also wanted to kind of highlight Wiener's uh, interest in this, and in a way, Wiener's sort of groundbreaking work with the human use of human beings. And I, I just want to briefly, just briefly um, describe this process of um, this process of communication that I think, in a sense, generates these scripts. So Wiener's idea was that, that uh, communication between people or between a machine. Um, he describes the sending of a message, the reception of the message, followed by an appropriate action, um, and then a related reply. And the, and the important part of this configuration is the reply, or the feedback. And it's the feedback or the reply that allows the mechanism, as Steve explained to you in the example of the, 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 the heating apparatus, the, the thermometer, um, to self-correct based on the information it receives and monitors. So Venus' vision of the human was a very fluid, continually developing organism that was characterised by some continuity of process through memory and also through regulated behaviour. And he compares many of the learning mechanisms um, that humans unconsciously use with this very model, with this kind of feedback model. And I think, I'm not going to give you any examples, but I think you can kind of imagine the sort of things that he might be thinking about. So we see and participate in these responsive feedback mechanisms all of the time. And my proposal to you is that they then generate patterns, scripts, if you like, that then um, determine how we act. And one of the uh, places where this is played out, as we've already mentioned and talked about, is in this kind of model of reality television. Um, and indeed, to some extent, in uh, Zemeski's repetition downstairs is too, which also Steve is now, and, and we will kind of discuss to, to, some, to some, some degree. So, and, and as Michael pointed out, it's clear that these, these studies in behaviour really fascinate us. So, trying to think through, what is that fascination? Why is it that these things fascinate us? Well, Slavoj Žižek has proposed that part of that fascination is the unsettling way that things like reality television has made us aware that in our own lives we already play out these roles. So we see the, the contestants, the repeated behaviour of the contestants, and we're able to compare their behaviour with our behaviour. So 
uh, and, and what we might do in similar situations. We're able to use them as a kind of model, a kind of hypothesis for our own situation. So what perhaps then happens is something similar to um, Breck's idea of Fairfrimdung's effect, where this kind of idea of alienation, where the, which is the, the, the kind of pi the, the, uh, the stage method that he pioneered with actors to um, play their roles in such a way that the audience were able to distance themselves from the character uh, that they were seeing, and um, so they were consciously aware of the dilemma that the actor was faced, rather than just simply being immersed in the kind of spectacle of the theatre that's unfolding. So what I'm kind of proposing is that something similar happens when we watch a reality TV program and participate in this kind of feedback loop of monitoring our own performance. We start to become aware of our own self-performance um, in relation to what we're seeing on the screen. And in a sense, you know, this idea that Brett pioneered feeds its way into our everyday existence. So we start um, performing um, an action rather than simply undertaking an action. We're aware of that, that difference. And the difference creates a kind of separation, a separation of our behaviour and also a separation of the language we use and its effects on the world. That's, that's my proposition. At the same time that we're doing this, governments, of course, are using staged and scripted performance techniques to persuade <coughs> us of things that they want to do, or things they want us to let them do. Vote for them as well, to agree to go to a war, it, you know, these kinds of things are obviously commonplace. They also use the, the same media feedback system, but they depend on it, um, and they depend on it to broadcast their message to us. Uh, and they also depend in, in very, very often on our response to that message. But they use it to achieve a totally different effect. They use every theatrical technique that they can so to ensure that that directing effect does not take place. So that we are completely immersed in their rhetoric and what they're saying. That, that their performance, in fact, becomes invisible. So the irony here, of course, is that these staged press briefings by governments use explicit performance um, methodologies and theatrical methodologies to make their stages in, in, stagings invisible, whereas the apparently real and staged performance of reality TV contestants make their and our performance highly visible. So for me there's a sort of implicit irony in this. Governments and institutions obviously use this space, they create these highly immersive situations for the audience and they also separate language from its effect. So, for instance, someone like Stanley Cohen has described these kind of techniques, these linguistic techniques, rhetorical techniques, <coughs> language codes that use methods of distancing and compartmentalisation and segmentation to distance and abstract any reference to kind of unpalatable actions that, that might be undertaken as a consequence of this uh, rhetoric that is being used. And it's sort of to this, really, that I want to turn um, with the new work that I'm, that I'm doing with Steve. And I'm particularly um, focused on and thinking through acts of violence or, or war, the kind of rhetoric that is used to instigate that. So the next piece that, the, 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 the piece that we've been working on and writing the script for, um, called Media Burn, um, is going to involve um, the, the sort of staging of a simulation of a press briefing. And... The, the, the language that will be used in this press briefing will be delivered by two actors um, who will be costumed in, in uh, generic political dress and generic military dress, will um, compose fragments from scripts that have come from these kinds of briefings from around the world, at least the English-speaking world, most of it, um, for the last 30 or 40 years. The, the actual press conference environment I'm going to construct will be, we won't turn the lights down, you don't really need to see this particularly well, will be very generic. So any kinds of ideas of national insignia will be removed, um, any flags, blank or monochrome, insignia is monochrome. There's, there's, no, there's no sense in which this is located in a time or a place, very unlike then the last pieces of work that I've, I've shown you. So what I'm going to do tonight is, is um, introduce you to um, two actors that I've been working with um, on this script, Wagner van Krofeldt and Daniel Popper, who are going to read 
a kind of work in progress, a sort of, a, a sort of a working through of some of the ideas that Steve and I are trying out. And we've kind of decided what we'd like to do is <coughs> public um, for you now. Um, so in a second, I'm going to hand over to them. This is good. The reading is going to, they're going to read a section that's about, I think, 10, about 12 minutes long. Um, and then after that, if there's time, I'm just going to show you how that kind of script is, is, is composed. So you guys want to come up on the stage. Good evening. Tonight, I want to talk to you on a subject of deep concern to us all and to many people in all parts of the world. Let no one doubt that this is a difficult and dangerous effort on which we have set out. No one can foresee precisely what course it will take or what costs or casualties will be incurred. Many months in which both our patience and our will will be tested. Months in which many threats and denunciations will keep us aware of our dangers. But the greatest danger of all would be to do nothing. We are all witnesses to the fact that many peoples are being continually subjected to hostile acts and crude pressure by a certain group of states which seek to set up not the legitimate interests and rights of other countries. The confused nature of this conflict cannot mask that this is the new face of an old enemy. We did not want a conflict. I need hardly tell you that. We have given our enemy every opportunity to withdraw. Time and again, the United Nations has called, upon him, has called upon him to leave the occupied country. In the patient diplomacy of the past five months, leaders from around the world have sought peace and then sought it again. But he has chosen war. He has rejected every attempt to reach a peaceful solution. He has rebuffed even the Secretary General of the United States. There will be requirements in this program for certain sacrifices. But I feel that when you measure those sacrifices against what we are fighting for, you will get a very much better idea of the necessities of the case. It is a difficult program. But there is no doubt whatever in my mind that if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. And there's no doubt in my mind that the whole world hangs in the balance. We are fully aware that war is not the only way to defend our values. <coughs> but if those values are fundamentally endangered, as is the case today, then war is the only way to defend them. Everything that hinders us in our effort to defend ourselves is an injustice. We did not want this war. It was thrust upon us, like all others. <clears throat> we also have to work those sort of a dark side, if you will. We've got to spend time in the shadows, in the intelligence world. A lot of what needs to be done here will have to be done quietly, <coughs> without any discussion using sources and methods that are available to our intelligence agencies if we're going to be successful. That's the world these folks operate in and so it's going to be vital for us to use any means at our disposal basically to achieve our objective. We do this in order to slow down aggression. It is, of course, the season of peace and goodwill. The armed forces will do their best to fight those forces of darkness. <laughs> Only we in this season can once again try to learn to live together. Because fighting for peace, freedom and justice <coughs> means that we are free to live together in the way we choose. <laughs> Courage, brother. Do not stumble. Though thy path 
be dark as night. There's a star to guide the humble. Trust in God and do the right. <laughs> Let the road be dark and dreary and its end far out of sight. Face it bravely, strong or weary. Trust God and do. We said at the outset, no sanctuary. We said we were going to go systematically and progressively to attack, disrupt, and degrade. That is precisely the process that's underway now. Step by step, day by day, with a great deal of precision, a great deal of attention to avoid collateral damage and civilian casualties. We are concerned for the safety of our own forces. We're going to minimize the risk to those forces while we accomplish the mission. And we are doing that. We have the means to protect ourselves from air attacks which we would use efficiently. We would also attack the territories from which the planes had taken off. And if there were a ground attack, we would react in a similar way. There are a lot of targets within the range of our missiles and planes. If there were to be an aggression against us by any world power, we would reply. And my fear, deeply held, based in part on the intelligence that I see, is that these threats come together and deliver a catastrophe to our country and world. These tyrannical states do not care for the sanctity of human life. The terrorists delight in destroying it. Some say, if we act, we become a target. The truth is, all nations are targets. I want to express my profound gratitude to the men and women of our armed forces and those of our allies. Day after day, night after night, they flew, risking their lives to attack their targets and to avoid civilian casualties when they were fired upon from populated areas. Thank you. You've made us very proud, and I feel very proud, even though they didn't elect me to be president. <laughs> the courageous resistance and great steadfastness of our noble people gave the aggressors what they deserve. They will be taught a lesson and the wanted attack will be resisted. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge structures collapsing have filled us with discipline, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat, but they have failed. Our country is strong. Our pilots have returned to base. The airstrikes have been suspended. Aggression against an innocent people has been contained and is being turned back. Leaders from around the world, meanwhile, have been working tirelessly to negotiate and enforce a ceasefire. This means, as all parties have agreed, a full withdrawal of all military forces from my country to the pre-conflict positions. There were a very, very large number of dead in these units. A very large number of dead. <coughs> we even found them ourselves when we went into the units ourselves and found them in the trench lines. They were very heavy desertions. It's a very, very tough and very unpleasant position. But I must tell you personally, I'm calm with that. Having in mind that all we were politically doing was oriented to peace. 
from the beginning of the crisis up to now. <coughs> the military were called in and they fulfilled a legal obligation because the executive and the judicial power, the Congress and the Supreme Court had publicly denounced the President and his government for their infractions of the Constitution. The atrocity charges in individual cases should not and cannot be allowed to reflect on their courage and their self-sacrifice. War is a terrible and cruel experience for a nation, and it is particularly terrible and cruel for those who bear the burden of fighting. Again, I stress, we do not have evidence at the moment, but I've never believed that the fact that we do not yet have evidence is a reason to simply dismiss claims that atrocities may well have been committed. The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, or vice versa. There are skilled and professional terrorists out there right now, examining our vulnerabilities and building devices designed to kill us. Lots of us. No matter what we do, we're going to be vulnerable. But the one thing I think we don't want is for the government to be hamstrung in the way it interrogates people who have knowledge of pending attacks. This is a careless violation of international law and the United Nations Charter. It is a deliberate effort of a powerful atheistic government to subjugate an independent Islamic people. The practice of involuntarily holding innocent civilians in the vicinity of military targets is illegal and reprehensible. International law prohibits the practice of deliberately placing non-combatants around military objectives in an effort to protect them from attack. The use of human shields is an illegal tactic that was used by, for example, the PLO in Lebanon in 1982 as well as the lawless Somali militia and by Saddam Hussein in occupied Kuwait. The resolution of the United Nations General Assembly unequivocally condemns as criminal all acts, methods and practices of terrorism. It calls upon all states in accordance with international law to refrain from organizing, instigating, assisting or participating in terrorist acts in other states. After the Achille Loro incident, the Security Council issued a statement condemning terrorism in all its forms everywhere. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, this is, this is the script you just heard read. Right. And you can see here, just in the uh, in the in, in, in the italics, are where these where these things come from. And, and I really do span a huge, huge, uh, a huge number of decades, and also um, a huge number of countries. So you know, we have Kennedy's radio television address in '62. We've got Khrushchev in 1960, and then going and, and John Major. 1990, going right down to Rafael Maddock um, uh, in 1995. And, and in a similar way here as well, um, we've got things like um, Abiy Solana from the NATO HQ in 1999 in the Kosovo conflict. Um, again, juxtaposed with Maddock from six years earlier um, in Bosnia to then Tony Blair um, more recently in 2003. So, um, I suppose the thing, that the, the thing that I want to follow up on, just very, very briefly, uh, before we move on to Michael, is the idea in which there's a rhetoric and a kind of space, that the, the political space, the ideological space, and also the media space that these events occupy is a very particular one. Daniel Borstein has sort of called these, way back in 1960, called these kinds of um, press briefings, or photo ops as they might have been called then, the pseudo-events. 
In other words, events like that sort of actually depend on their mediation. They depend on the circularity of them being filmed and broadcast in order to, to become, as it were, real events. So they're not, they're, not about, they're not about something happening in the world that is then, then kind of recorded. They're actually you know, staged to be part of this circular process. The other thing as well that I just want to sort of pull, draw your attention to as well, and the thing that I'm really keen on, on, on getting across in this, <coughs> in this piece of work, is the idea that, that, that whilst this language, this kind of rhetoric, is abstracted and separated out from, um, from any effect it might have, as I was saying earlier, there shouldn't be any doubt that the effect that it does have is, of course, absolutely catastrophic for those people um, with who, at whom it's directed to. As you can see, there are kind of a variety of people as well, from, um, you know, from the West to you know, um, Bosnia to the US to uh, whoever. So the idea then that language is not this kind of um, abstracted referential thing that, that sort of circles around in a kind of media space, but that actually it has very, very powerful effects and, and, uh, and, and, and an incredibly, you know, incredibly destructive impact on the people who it, it's directed. Contrasted with, of course, the reception that we have of this language, direct, you know, kind of in a sense directed in the opposite, from the opposite point of view, where it's, it's trying to sort of bridge this space, basically, the, the space of this kind of violence and the space of the kind of consent and justification for the violence. And I think this is something that um, probably Michael is going to um, slightly address as well. So I think, I think at this point I'm going to stop now and turn over to Michael, who's going to present some of his work. Okay.